turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Now, Matthew chapter 7, along about verse 20 and 21 and 22 down there, that's the Lord Jesus Christ talking, and he says some other startling thing there. Of course, he, he always says some startling things, and people don't think he was startling or shocking, just don't read the Bibles very much. I get letters all the time, people get real upset with me, <clears throat> and say, well, you're too hard, you're too cruel, and you're not kind, there's too much hate. And Jesus only spoke about love, and Jesus wouldn't offend anybody, and Jesus always loved everybody, and never spoke unkind to the people. That's a bunch of rubbish. Some of the hardest things ever said in this earth are said by Jesus Christ. And that's one right there. Now, that passage right there, look at that passage, and he says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, that's the right thing to call him, have not done many wonderful works in my name. And he says, cast out devils in my name. All these things, in his name, in his name. That's what you hear folks say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. Well, that's the right name. That's the right name. But many are going to say, we've done many wonderful works in your name, and we've cast out devils in your name. And then he goes on down there and says, and I will say to them, he says, depart me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. That shows you something. They are somebody who expects to be accepted when they get to heaven, and they're not accepted. There's somebody who had every right in the world to believe they were going to make it, and they didn't make it. That's a shocking thing. And I learned several things about that text that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. I call that the terrible text. And there's only one text in the Bible any worse than that. And that's over there in uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. In Matthew 25, verse 41, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Depart from me, you cursed and everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Now, I'll talk about that in verse in a minute. But uh, that's a terrible thing. It's a terrible, it'd be a terrible thing for you to get up there and expect you're going to get into glory and wind up in a lake of fire. That'd be a terrible thing. And this text here where they say, many will say in that day, have not done many works in your name, done this and that, and cast out devils in your name. And then he says to them, depart me, work iniquity, I never knew you. But I learned some things from studying that text, and I'm going to talk about those things tonight. Uh, first of all, I learned from this text, uh, I learned there's a possibility of being deceived. The text implies there's a possibility of being deceived. And you've got to admit that's true. I hope you're not. Maybe you're not. And I hope you're not. But there's a possibility. You have to accept that. There's a possibility of being deceived. Folks say, well, I, uh, God just wouldn't fool anybody. People get fooled all the time. i got a friend who had, a, had his wife upstairs in the hospital getting worked on, and they were downstairs praying for her. And about the time they were thanking God for her healing and her recovery, somebody gave her a wrong blood transfusion upstairs, and she died. And she died right where they were praying, left him with three kids. She had to raise by himself. Oh, that, you that that nurse up there, that nurse up there didn't intend to give the wrong type blood. She just did. She was deceived. You've got to admit there's a possibility you could be fooled. You're not foolproof. Over there in Italy about 15 years ago, I clipped an article out of a magazine, and that article out of a magazine said that somebody had caught somebody there for selling wine on the market in Italy for something like, uh, all oh, about 10 years, they've been selling this delicious wine, extra cheap, and they've been buying it, and they found it was one quarter ox blood. Taking that bottle and one quarter of that thing was blood out of an ox. Well, the people who drank that were deceived. They didn't, they didn't know. I mean, some folks think, they think very, very highly of, uh, Rome. You've got a lot of Roman Catholics in America, I think very highly of their work. Uh, can you get in on that? But female students from an exclusive Roman Catholic University of Manila chant anti-U.S. slogans as the flag is burned in front of them on their campus. That's some of John Paul, uh, two beloved folks there, burn your flag. You know why they can burn your flag? Because the Supreme Court said they could. Thank you for the word. You thought you put some judges in to support the Constitution? Ha <laughs> ha, you got fooled. <laughs> they didn't. You thought, well, the, the Roman Catholic Church is a good church and has no political interest in America? I got fooled again, didn't you? It happens all the time. It's possible to get fooled. Somebody said one time that uh, Christopher Columbus went out to find India, and when he got where he was going, he didn't know where he was, and he didn't know where he was going when he went out. When he got back, he didn't know where he'd been. It's kind of like the Carter administration. <laughs> 
I mean, they don't know where they're going, they don't know how to get there. When they get there, they don't know where they are, and they come back, they don't know where they've been. Uh, he was deceived. He said, I found a short route to India. He did not find a short route to India, but he thought he had. You've got to admit there's a possibility of being deceived. I mean, uh, when Eisenhower came in, everybody said, this fellow's a conservative. He's a pine Republican conservative, you know. I mean, a vote for him. Uh, by John O. Rice and the soul of the Lord said, if you voted for Adley Stevens instead of Eisenhower, you were backslidden or unsaved. <laughs> That's a dumb thing to put in the Christian newspaper. Um, they got him there and said, he's conservative. He called out National Guard troops to enforce racial mixing. He was conservative. Eisenhower was in charge of an operation in Europe called Kiel Hall that took people in Germany after the war and sent 20,000 of them back into concentration camps in Russia to get killed. I'm like, I thick with dick. <laughs> you can be deceived. You might as well face it. You can be deceived. It's possible. Somebody gave Martin Luther King Jr. the Nobel Peace Prize. God save you from a peace like that, brother. <laughs> Make sure to go in good and go to Vietnam and bring some of his peace over there. And somebody said, well, put him in. Ted Kennedy. But you know who got that Martin Luther King national birthday in? It was Ted Kennedy in 1978. He proposed a federal, a federal law granting a birthday for that fellow with a flag at half mass on the grounds he was a great American. Did you know you can be deceived? Don't you get mad with me. I said you can be deceived. Don't, don't sit there and lie and say I can't. You can too. And your mother and your kids and all your friends. Is there a possibility you're deceived? I didn't say you were, but you've got to admit there's a possibility. I mean, any man whose private life will has to be buried in a record you can't look at for 50 years, <laughs> I don't know about that. I mean, they had Oliver North there in the grill and made, made his life a public exposure for months at a time, every detail of it. Why, they make a birthday for him. Wasn't he a good American? Amen. How many of you think Oliver North was a good American? Let me see your hands. Pan in there. Will your brother pan there? Give, give, me, give me some of them hands. Oh, can you say stuff? How about a birthday for him? He don't have to bury his life in a secret archive where nobody gets to look at it. But right out in the open. He's still a great American after it's out in the open. That father is a great American with nobody knowing what he was or what he did. Could it be you were deceived? Maybe he wasn't a great American. Maybe he was a communist. Maybe he was a Marxist. He said he was. <laughs> oh, I'm making perhaps some friends tonight. Out there in Radio Land, across those times, sure, I make you a lot of friends. You haven't got any sense. Turn the thing off. Get you another channel. I mean, don't get upset. Just do something. It's a free country. If you don't like it, turn it off. <laughs> and that's how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> you take you take Corral down there, that fella Corral down there, somewhere down. Was he down in New Orleans, that madman? Someplace down there. That Corral, he used to collect 15-year-old boys and take them out and rape them and torture them to death and then bury them in plastic bags in the beach. Twenty-three of them. I mean, they found twenty-three of them. Now, what do you suppose those little boys thought getting in that car? He'd drive around a van, tell a boy get in the car if he's on a bicycle, drive his bicycle back in the car, and he'd take him for a trip. What do you think that little boy thought? Get in that van with that fellow, nice fellow, going to give him some candy and give him the back end of the van, take him a trip someplace? Why don't get tortured to death and buried on the beach? Don't say it can't happen. It happens all the time. People can be deceived. Now, it's possible some of you might be deceived. I hope you're not. I hope you're not. But you've got to admit it's a possibility. Oh, I'll tell you something else about this text. This text not only implies the possibility of being deceived, it nullifies all good works as a means of salvation. If you're sitting here tonight and you're hoping, uh, hope against hope, that somehow or another you're going to get to heaven the good works, this text should, should put you out and stop your foolish thinking once and for all. Have we not many done many wonderful works in your name? And your name cast out devils, and your name done this, and your name done that? See? I mean, if a fellow could get to say by doing good works, that surely would do the job. I mean, they said, we did this in your name, we did that in your name, we did this in your name, we did that in your name. Yeah, but they weren't saved. It not apply to that business of good works getting you to heaven. The idea of good works getting you saved and getting you to heaven is a pipe dream. That's a pagan pipe dream. I'm here to tell you here tonight that Jesus Christ did not come to share anybody's sins. He came to bear them. He's a sin bearer, not a sin sharer. He don't pay half of it, you pay half of it. He pays the whole thing. There's no share to it. You don't get in nothing. You're going to share Jesus' love? Sorry, you're out. He did the whole thing. 
a fellow one time was uh, converted by a dream that he had. And somebody said, what did you dream? He said, I, he said, I dreamt I died. And he said, I wanted to go to heaven when I died. So I began to climb. And he said, my dream, he said, I climb and climb and climb and climb. He, he said, it seemed like ages. And he said, finally, he said, I, I climbed up this ladder, and this ladder kept getting higher and higher, and I climbed up to the stars and went up past the moon. I thought I'd never have to stop climbing. And finally, he said, I saw a door up there and a light. And he said, I said to myself, this is the door to heaven. And he said, I climbed up the top of the ladder, was about to go through this door at the top of the ladder. And about that time, he said, an angel poked his head uh, through the hole in the top of the uh, of the ladder, and uh, where the, uh, the, top, the window at the top of the ladder where the ladder ended. And he said, uh, what are you doing? And he said, I'm climbing up to heaven. And he said, the angel said, you're a thief and a robber. Get out. The Bible said, he that climbeth up by some other way is a thief and a robber. If you get to heaven without Jesus Christ, they kick you out. You get to heaven by grace. Don't you remember when Joseph or Jacob was out there sleeping at night in Genesis 28 and had that dream? And he went, the ladder was on the ground, the top reached to heaven with the foot of one on the ground. Picture of Christ, son of man, got his feet in the dirt. Son of God got his hand in heaven, glory. That's the ladder. Jesus Christ. You climb up some other way, you're a thief and you're a robber. That, that pagan plan of salvation where God's everybody's father and we're all children, that is a pagan pipe dream. That is a hallucination. Let me tell you something, brother and sister. If you could strong arm the angels and get to heaven by your good works and strong arm the angels and beat your way in and break down the door and get in up there, you'd be a, you'd be a curiosity. You'd be a museum piece. And if you got to heaven by your own works, what would you sing about when you got up there? They sing in heaven. They get around the throne, they sing, and then him that loved us and died for us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. They sing a new song before the throne and before the Lamb. And they sing unto him that loved us and died for us. And they sing all glory and blessing and power be to the Lamb and glory forever. Why, well, if you got to heaven by your works, what would you sing? Might, suppose you got to heaven by your works, got up there and stood up there and said, Here I am, everybody. <laughs> They said, shut, shut that fool up. We're having a worship service up here. <laughs> and some of you say, yeah, but I made it. I made it. I held out to the end. I repented and believed and baptized, you know, and I talked in tongues and had initial evidence for the Holy Ghost. And I'm here. Look, folks, I endured to the end. Uh, I made it. I made it. Look at me. Everybody say, shut up. Shut up. You know what they're doing? They're praising the Lamb. They said, him that loved us and died for us and washed us from us in his own blood and fall down, taking the crowns and cast them at his feet. No, we're going to pay attention to you, you little old Baptist, you little old repentance, you little old beads, you little old Rosie, you little old candles, you little old Christopher. Yeah, 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 yeah. You little dead horse religion. Well, some of you folk got, you got a stick horse religion, what you got. When I was a boy, you know, we didn't have any toys much. I wanted any money to buy them. So we had to make them up. And uh, most of the boys around the place had them a broom they used for a horse. And it wasn't a horse, it was a broom. But you'd ride it like this, see. You'd go around the house like this with this silly stick. And you know, then you take it to the, to the water and fall from the kitchen, you know, and give it some water, you know, and bounce. You think that's kind of foolish, foolish? Why millions of Americans have a stick horse religion? Your little old dead stick, you know, and you take it around the sacraments, you know, and take it around here at the blessing on it, you know, and then take it around here, you know, to can take the guru, ain't got any life, it's just a broomstick. Well, this thing nullifies all possibility of ever getting saved by works. You can't get saved by works. He said, well, I'm going to live right and straighten up. What about the past death? These people say, well, I'm going to live right. Listen, if you straighten up tonight and never sin again the rest of your life, and God forbid such a thing should happen, but if you just straighten up a night and never sin again, what about the debt you already owe? I mean, if a fellow come to me and say, I'd like to borrow $500 from you, Ruckman, I would say, when are you going to pay it back? I'll pay you back next month. I own the $500, next month I don't get any money. And two months later, the guy comes around and says, I'm out again. I need to borrow some more money. I say, how much you need? I need $100. I say, what about the 500 old Joe? I'm going to pay it back. When are you going to pay it back? I'll pay it back for you next month. What about this other 100? I'll pay it back for you in two months. Now I loaned him the money, and three months later, I haven't got any money. And the fellow comes around, and I said, don't tell me you want some more money. And you say, no, I just came by to tell you I'm never going to borrow from you again. I said, that's the best news I've heard in a long time. I said, by the way, what about the, what about the, the money? What about the 500 and the 100? What about that money? You say, well, I can't pay it, but I'm not going to borrow anymore. Now listen, you might live a perfect life the rest of your life, but you already owe God a debt you can't pay. And somebody, who's going to pay for it? You going to pay for it? 
This thing nullifies all good works and means of getting to heaven. That isn't all. My text does something else. My text magnifies the need of making your calling and election sure. I heard a pastor in my Bible that says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. That means make sure you're one of the elect. You say, how do you do that? Examine yourself. Prove yourself. Check on yourself. Ask yourself, am I saved? When was I saved? Where was I saved? How was I saved? Who saved me? Check on yourself. Make sure you're converted. Be, get diligence to make your calling and election sure. You might be deceived. You might be deceived. There's a fellow there in David Shakavishli, uh, over in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, in Moscow, who was a janitor of a museum over there. And nobody knew about his janitorial duties except the government. And when people come through there, he gave them a card saying doctor, and with his name on it, doctor of technical, of technical sciences. And he used to charge $20 an hour for lectures, and his first lecture he got $820 from the congregation coming in there. And for years that guy lectured on Egyptology, and people thought he was a doctor of science, and he was a janitor. He was a janitor, <laughs> just making the stuff up. You want to get diligence to make your election and your calling? Sure. Make it certain. Don't let this thing go by. You're careful about your lawn, some of you. Careful about your children. Careful about your wife. Careful about your husband. Careful about your insurance policies. Careful about your car payments. You're not careful about your soul. I know a guy preached in this country for years down in New Orleans. His name was Shelton, L.R. Shelton. And L.R. Shelton is what they call a hyper-Calvinist. And he got a boy here in town who's been preaching now here about uh, 10 years. He's a hyper-Calvinist. And L.R. Shelton says that he preached for 25 years before he was saved. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I know that uh, it's, it's, it's possible. And I know a couple of preachers I think it probably happened to. He said he preached 25 years before he was saved. And I don't know if that's true, for sure. I mean, those fellows, I'm always kind of suspicious of them, because when they do finally get saved, the first thing they do is go out on preaching, which is rather peculiar. I mean, if the fellows call the preacher, he's not to be a novice. <laughs> and if the guy was deceived for 25 years, how you know he isn't deceived again? You know, but, but he said he was unsaved for 25 years. It's possible. It's possible for a fellow to preach 25 years and be a lost man. You have diligence to make your calling and election sure. Um, you said, what are you drawing up? I'm drawing two angels. Christ said the angels shall, uh, see, this isn't fiction. Christ said the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and wailing. See, I'm not making it up. Well, it's not just a Pharisee. No, this is Jesus Christ. I'm, he's doing the narrating. He said, The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just and cast them to a furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashed of teeth. Horrible. See, I didn't say that. I didn't write the book. I'm innocent, man. I'm a fellow called to preach what God says. Right away, he's a target. Why target me? I didn't write the book. Christ said, The angels, and so I put wings on them so you know the angels. Now, you know angels don't have wings. You know that. How many of you know angels don't have wings? Let me see your hands. Oh, I'm good, see. But they have a congregation. If you don't put wings on, my folks say, what's that? <laughs> it's an angel. You put wings on them so they know they're angels. <laughs> and he said, they'll take and they'll cast, they'll, they'll sever the wick from the just and cast from the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnash of teeth. Now, Jesus Christ said that. And that's a terrible thing to say. Somebody taking you and pitching you, pitching you bodily in a furnace of fire. That's rough. That is really something to say, isn't it? I was quoting Jesus saying, Come unto me and bless the pure in heart and bless all the peacemakers, for they should be called the children of God. Uh huh. Into a furnace of fire, too, buddy. Into a furnace of fire, weeping and wailing and gnash of teeth. You want to get diligence to make your calling and election sure. You can't be too careful about this one. If you weren't careful about anything else, you ought to be careful about this one. Jack Hiles, many years ago, was a paratrooper back in the, during the Korean conflict. Uh, it was a war, they called it a conflict. And he's back in that conflict, and he and a family had to crack shoots at night one time for a demonstration. Uh, I think Fort Bragg, one of those places, 110 Airborne, one of those outfits, 82nd, I forget which. But anyway, he was packing shoots for the buddy, and they stayed up all night packing shoots. And the next day, the big brass was going to be in there, you know, and... Uh, we're going to be jumping them out of a, little, a couple of dozen of those transports and going to be mass landings. And they were up all night and, and uh, keeping themselves awake in black coffee, packing those, pa uh, packing those chutes. And every packer who packed a chute had to stamp his number on the chute uh, to show that he was one that packed it in case something was defective. 
Of course, with all that good does, the guy with the shoot, you know. But anyway, the next day, they're coming out all like popcorn, coming down there with no thing, coming out in the strings. And about that time, uh, that big brass down there, jeeps and everything, and the staff cars watching that mess, began to point up and yell and scream, saw a horrible thing, kind of plummeting down there, just sailing down, man. And that chute never came open all the way down. He just came on down about 10,000 feet and just hit the ground. Man, you could stir him in your foot after he hit. And all those cars came there, and the big brass was around there, and siren was blowing, people yelling, screaming, and rushing, who did this, who did that, and all that kind of stuff going on. And about that time, they said, all right, let's get the chute packer. And they checked the number on that chute, and they called for the fellows who packed the chute the night before. And Hiles and his buddy had to come. And a jeep bought him over that big blast, and all the way over, Jack said, he was saying to himself, my God, I hope it wasn't me. My God, I hope it wasn't me. My God, I hope it wasn't me. And they got over there and checked that guy's number, but look at his buddy. Jack Hiles' buddy went back and shoots right next to him all night. Got careless and done something there, messed up something, packed Made some fold of some press, some he shouldn't have made. And when he saw that number, he said that Jack said that kid next to him reached up and got, got, got a hook of his hair and actually pulling his hair and screaming and saying, Oh my God, if I'd only been more careful, if I'd been more careful, if I'd just been more careful. That's a good thing for a fellow in hell to say. If I'd just been more careful, you weren't. You weren't. I mean, the preacher got up and told you about salvation, told you about the blood of Christ, and told you about death, and told you about judgment, and you just, you know, took it to the grain of salt, didn't you? Yeah, put us in the preacher, you give an invitation. They got up and say, you know, you don't catch me down on a bunch of hypocrites. Uh-huh. Stupid. 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 You're stupid. You're stupid. That's what your problem is. If you had any brains, you'd be careful. I mean, I mean, talk to me about it. Will you talk to me about it? I mean, you want, you want a slip shot, rough, slam bang job, I'm the man for it. I'm one of the most careless fellows you ever saw in your life to get something done. I mean, sledgehammer, double bladed act, my way of doing things. Grenades, bombs, and your foot. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I've been careful about that thing. And some of you haven't. Some of you haven't. Some of you sat there and they're singing, just I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Not that bid me come to the old Lamb of God, I come. And the preacher's done up there and said, uh, if there's somebody here tonight, raise your hand and say, pray for me. I'm not a Christian. I've never been saved. Pray for me. I want to be a Christian. I don't want to go to hell when I die. And you sat back there and messed around, messed around. We had some couple back there, some of report on a couple of weeks ago. Two of me and sitting back there hugging and kissing each other, doing the invitation. You don't give a flip. You ain't, got a, you ain't got a lick of sense. You shouldn't even be in a church. And I mean, invitation giving people, shooting the bullets, shooting the bull, and say people around them, you know, nervous and looking around. Well, I get out of here, you know, move over, that kind of thing. And some of you sitting back there and say, I've heard that before. It can't scare me. I thought, that's what a chink to, uh, Chinaman told me up in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Mount Air, North Carolina about five years ago. You know what that Chinese told me? Red Chinese. I mean, from inland. Red China. I came up to him, got on my knees in front of him out there in the congregation during the invitation. I lost four of them out there, so there was four of them sitting there. I got knees in front of him, and I said, wouldn't you come with me down the order to receive Jesus Christ? And he turned to his interpreter, buddy, they knew a little bit English. And so I told him, talk, tell him, Stephen, tell him, tell him or something or other. And the guy turned to me, and he said, he says, you can't scare him. He said, that fellow doesn't scare me. He can't scare me. And the fellow told me that, and I told the interpreter, you tell your buddy, I'm going to pray for you, buddy, every day after I leave here, and God's going to scare the hell out of him. And the interpreter turned around, throw him, 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 I got a letter from one of them, about four months later, the guy got saved. The guy got saved. The fear of the Lord at the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord at the beginning of wisdom. But it shows you got to be careful. Some of you have been real careless about it. It's amazing how much care people take with everything in the world except their soul. There's something else about this text. This text verifies the certainty of eternal banishment. You don't like to think about it, this text verifies it. Depart me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Depart me, ye curse of everlasting fire, prepare the devil and his angels. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Over there in the book of Revelation, he says, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. How in the world did you let some J.W. come around to you or somebody like Garner Ted Armstrong and tell you hell with the grave with a text like that? Can you imagine that? Some of you telling you hell with the grave when he says, cast him into a furnace of fire. 
You say you burn go in the furnace of fire, then you're going to burn up not that bunch. You can't burn up a soul. A soul isn't physical. How are you going to burn up a soul? Why, he says, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. He says, back in the book of Daniel, he says, they'll awake some to everlasting shame and everlasting punishment, everlasting contempt, everlasting shame, everlasting punishment. You can't punish something that's been annihilated. The very idea of teaching, well, in the furnace of fire, you get annihilated. You do. Why is it everlasting punishment? You say get annihilated. Why is it everlasting torment? A corpse can't suffer everlasting torment, everlasting punishment, everlasting shame, everlasting contempt. This verifies the certainty of eternal punishment. I mean, uh, I, I don't like to harp on these things, talk about these things. You get talking about these things, people think, oh, well, you know, those people are just sadistic, you know. Like to think about people going to hell and burning, you know, and try to scare them. No, no, that ain't, that ain't it. 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 I've got as much capacity for mirth and kidding around and having a good time than they probably you ever saw in your life. Honest to God. Really. I mean, actually, I mean, no bull. I mean, the real thing, man. I mean, those that know me know that. I mean, I do all kinds of crazy stuff. I just enjoy doing i got as much capacity for a joke as anybody you've met in your life. I sent a picture one time to Bob Jones Jr. of myself sitting at a piano with a wig on. In my bare feet, playing the piano with my toes. He got my toes up on the keyboard, playing on the piano with my toes, and a wig. <laughs> he never even acknowledged, he never even acknowledged having gotten that thing. Why, well, if he like about me like he does, why don't he print it nationwide? He don't dare. You know why? Because I'm supposed to be a real bad cat that's upsetting folks. I'm supposed to be this grim old ogre with these fire teeth that breathes fire and spits on people, you know, and poisons them. And how could a fellow like that get a picture of him taken like that? I got pictures of myself on lying a pile of dead fish, a hundred pounds of fish, with a fish in my mouth. <laughs> Nail to hot dog hymers and tell him, the most dangerous man in America. <laughs> what a bunch of, well, there's a word for it. <laughs> I mean, what a bunch, man. They don't dare put that shop because I don't give the right image, you see. I'm going to come to that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm all for it, man. I'm all for it. But let me tell you something. When it comes to the matter of your eternal soul, when it comes to the matter of your eternal destiny, when it comes to the matter of you dying and facing God for judgment, I'm going to tell you the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And you're not going to stand up there and point your finger at Ruckman and say, Your fault, your fault. You, you joked, you jested, you made me laugh. You didn't care about my soul. It's his fault, Lord. It's his fault. He didn't tell me. He gave me smooth oratory and you put it pictures for me and didn't warn me. I'll warn you. If it makes you my enemy, tough apples. That's just how it's going to be. I like to have friends, I like to enjoy life, and I like to enjoy your company, and have you enjoy my company, when it comes to these kind of things there, no compromise. No com You're not going to blame me. When I get up there, brother, as far as your soul is concerned, my hands aren't going to look like that. They're going to be lily white. As far as your, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you. But upset you, okay, all right. You get bad opinion, okay, but I'm, you're going to be fooled. You're not going to get up there and say, cursed be your rhetoric, cursed be your oratory, cursed be your talent. You didn't tell me. I'm going to tell you. And I'm telling you right now. This text certifies the uh, certainty of eternal banishment. Somebody goes to hell. Somebody burns. You better handle it to be you. Two fellows went on the road one night in the car, and they're going to go fishing at a, a wide river bend down there. It's been raining pretty hard. And they got going on that car in the middle of the night. They, the lights hit a sign there posted beside of the car. And it said, uh, bridge washed out two miles ahead. And they, you know, punched each other, you know, you all bitch, you know. And went on down, and it was washed out. And they turned around, about 30 minutes later, they came back up that same road, and the back side of that sign, they saw some words that said, it was, wasn't it? <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I'm telling you, before you go, there's no bridge. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And all the other bridges are washed out. And you go out, you go right out into a lake of fire. And the pity is, when you find that out, you can't come back, see, and find a sign that says, I told you so. The pity is, what you do is come up before the white throne judgment, and when you come up before the white throne judgment, there I am standing there, 
the image of his son, made just like Jesus Christ, my body fashioned like according to his glorious body. And I point a finger at you and I say, I told you so. I told you so. It was washed out, wasn't it? Don't do you any good then. It verifies the certainty of eternal banishment. And finally about this text, this text, uh, it amplifies the most horrible words ever spoken on this earth. Now, I, I know this is sound new to you, but some of you never just thought about it. And the average person in America is so brainwashed, all the junk they get, they don't think about these kind of things. But the truth of the matter is the most terrible, and I can prove it, the truth of the matter is the most terrible, horrible, awful, most tragic, terrible thing ever said in this earth came from the lips of the one who said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the children of God. And I'll prove it in a minute. I'll say it again. The most terrible words heard in this earth are not heard in a, in a faggot spa in Frisco. And the most terrible words in this earth are not heard in a shower room, a locker room of a, a NHL or NFL team. And the most horrible, terrible things ever said in this earth are not said in the slammer or the police court. And they're not said in the doctor's office. Although they say some pretty tough things. It's criminal. That's pretty tough, isn't it? It's criminal. The fellow says, it's malignant. You've got AIDS. You're dying of cancer. There's some, you know, there's some hard things folks can say to folks. You take, uh, you take David's up there with a tower, and he's, uh, gone up there and, and, uh, been fasting and praying and crying for God to save his little old boy, and come as a punishment for his sins, and they come to him and they have uh, something for him to say. They say, the child is dead. That's quite a thing to hear. I think we we're praying for somebody of the day, uh, some kind of rentals or the, or the bird died. The child dead. That's pretty tough to take as your own child. You know that? And one time another, Dave was up there in the tower after the battle with Absalom and Abner and them fighting out there. And he's going across the tower there and the messenger coming. And a messenger comes up and he says, the boy Absalom safe? Is the boy Absalom safe? And they said, well, I don't know. I saw a big tumor over there, but I didn't know what it was. He said, how about the boy Absalom? And I said, I don't know, King, how it went. At that time, another run had come up there and bowed down and salam before that king. And he bowed down there and said, oh, my lord, the king, all the enemies of my lord, the king, are dead. And David said, the boy, the boy, the boy Absalom. And he said, all the enemies of my lord, the king, be, as that young man, dead. Tough. That's tough, boy. Get him back to the car. Killed in action. That's tough. I sent you to be hanged by your neck till you're dead. Pretty tough statement. Somebody says to you, go to hell. Pretty hard talk, but they can't send you. The most terrible thing ever said in that, in, on this earth. I mean, nothing that Muhammad said, Buddha said, Charlemagne said, Hitler said, any pope said could come near it is in Matthew 25. Turn to it there. I'll give you time to turn to it. Matthew 25, verse 41. That is, by all odds, the most horrible thing ever said in this earth, and nothing could compete with it or come close to it. And I'm telling you, a lot of horrible things said in this earth. A lot of terrible things, man. I hate you. I wish you were dead. I don't care if you burn in hell. I don't care if you rot in hell. I got up to my sister one time, told her after I witnessed my mother, and she said, you're double damned for upsetting my mother, and you can go to hell, blam, blam, across that thing. And I wrote my sister back a letter and said, uh, I'll be praying for you and Mama. I'm not worried about you being telling me to go to hell. I've been told to hell, go to hell before, and I ain't going. I'm going home to heaven. There's some hard things people can say to folks. I've heard some awful hard things. I mean, I couldn't repeat a lot of them. But the worst thing I ever heard is right on your lap. Matthew 25, 41. Back there in the back. Somebody stand up and read it for us real loud. Back there in the back. 25, 41. Not the most terrible thing ever said in this earth. Nothing could come anywhere near it. You like what you read there? Depart from me, you cursed. You damned, get out of here and burn. And burn forever. And the man who said that has power to do it. Now listen. Hey, boy. The man that said that loved you enough to die for you to keep you out of there. Now, you figure something more horrible than that. Tell me all about it, will you? That's the most terrible thing ever spoken on this earth. 
Here's somebody that loved men enough to die for them. Here's somebody who laid down his life and died for men and died for sinners and shed his blood on the cross and went through a hell on earth for men and suffered a horrible death for men, naked and shame, wounded, bleeding and dying. And then someday he faces those people he died for and says, You damn so-and-so, get out of here, burn, don't come back. You can't get any rougher than that. That's just, that's the most horrible thing anybody ever said. You know anything anybody ever said equal that? You never heard of it. The Council of Trent says, if a fellow doesn't like, believe this, let him be anathema. If a fellow don't believe that, let him be anathema. If a man don't believe this, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. Let him be cursed. Let him be damned. Let him be damned. Yeah, but they couldn't enforce that. The curse causeless shall not come, he says in the Proverbs. This could be a guy curse you and damn you. That don't mean anything. He can't do nothing about it. <laughs> but this one here can do something about it. What do you do when you stand up there and look him right in the face? And you look in his eyes, and those eyes look right back at you. You know what those eyes say? Those eyes say, I'm in the light of the body of the eye. And that eye looks you right in the face, and that eye says, I'm the one that died for you. I'm the one that gave my life for you. I'm the one that went to the cross for you to get you saved, and you wouldn't listen. And that finger goes right out in your face and says, Depart me, you curse and everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and angels. Boy, don't tell me you heard anything that bad in this earth. Because you didn't, honey, you didn't. And you ain't going to hear nothing that bad as long as you're down here. I mean, General Lee had it bad enough. You take when he had to surrender and turn over his sword, he said, I've got to go meet General Grant today, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. His men said, don't surrender. He said, you've got to surrender. You're out of ammo. ammo. They said, we'll throw stones. At the last two battles, they threw stones. And General Lee said, I've got to go to the courthouse today and surrender to General Grant, and I'd rather die a thousand deaths. You know what that Christian gentleman had to do in front of that lush? And Grant was a lush. <laughs> that Christian gentleman had to take out that sword and handle that thing over, help first to a lush, a drunk, and say, I surrender. Oh, that must have been hard to say. Oh, that must have been hard to say. But I'll tell you, the hardest words you ever heard were not that. The hardest words weren't, I surrender. The hardest words weren't, are you under arrest? The hardest words aren't, you're going to prison. The hardest words aren't, I sent you 25 years of hard labor. They get tough. The hardest words are, I sent you electric chair. Those aren't the hardest words. The hardest words aren't, when I just killed your wife and your kids. The hardest words are not, your whole family was killed in the car wreck. There are all kinds of terrible things folks can hear. The hardest words are not, your whole family was killed in the car wreck here. Like, That's tough. That's rough. That's rough. Fella come at Job and he says, Job, you know what happened? What? Your, your, your kids are all gone, they're all dead, your property's all gone, your camels are all gone, your cattle are all gone, gone. your grass is burned up, a, a tornado came and hit the house and the kids are all dead. Boy, what news, man. But nothing like this. Depart from you, curse of everlasting fire, prepare the devil with angels. I don't know, you get out, burn, you never come back, burn forever. Go join the devil. And the one that said that was the one that said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Come unto me, all ye the labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you shall find rest of your souls. That's the one. I read my Bible one place over there in the book of Revelation. When Jesus Christ came back, they said, Cover us from the face of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath is coming, who shall be able to stand? Just don't think about what a strange thing that is. Save us from the wrath of the lamb. But the lamb, the, the baby sheep, the day of his wrath has come. Well, what would a lamb do if he lost his temper? He couldn't do anything. And that's the lamb right there. But now he's a king. He's a lion. And that lamb points his finger at you and says, I'm the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You didn't want it. Okay, bear your sin and go pay for him. Beat it. Out. Out. But God on my back was throwing out. The God I gave the cerebral point out. But God, I, I, I helped the community fund the United out. But God, I'm a 32nd degree out. But God out, throw him out. Christ said, the angel shall come forth and sever the wick from the just and cast from the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping. There shall be wailing. There shall be gnashing of teeth. And that's going to be it. 
You know, years ago down south, we had a kind of a benevolent dictator over in Louisiana called Huey Long. He went to Franklin's Borders, and he got on the doctors, you know, about socialized medicine and stuff, and they finally decided to kill him, and a doctor finally killed him. And the morning Huey Long was assassinated in the capital of Baton Rouge, he'd been staying in a hotel the night before, and he came down and walked to a crowded uh, uh, ante room there in the lobby, full of reporters, all trying to get a story from him as he went on his way to his chauffeur to get to the state capitol. And there was one old white-haired farmer there that knew Huey Long when he was a boy upstate in Louisiana. You know, Louisiana Catholic and Baptist. The southern part's Catholic, northern part's Baptist. One of his old farm buddies up there someplace was trying to get to him, and he going through the press there, he was waving a sheet of paper over his head and saying to Louis, he said, Huey Long, he was saying, Huey, can I have just a minute of your time? Just just give me just give me a five minutes of your time. Uh, Huey, I, I need to talk to you about something, some bill or some performance. Just five minutes. And without turning around, going off that door, heading for the Capitol building, Huey Long said, I couldn't give you five minutes if you were Jesus Christ. And went on out the door. And you know something? That was the last thing anybody heard him say. The fellow who chauffeured him said he didn't say nothing in the car on the way to the Capitol. And the last thing anybody heard that fellow say when he was alive was, I couldn't give you five minutes if you were Jesus Christ. And that fellow walked up the state capitol and walked down through the corridors there by those posts, and a medical doctor stepped down behind those things, drilled him about three times at a range of about five feet, and killed him. Now, can you imagine that? The guy says, I couldn't give you five minutes of my time. I couldn't give you five minutes five of Jesus Christ. Bam! What did you say? What did you say? The Lord says, you couldn't, you couldn't give him five minutes? I guarantee you, brother, you're going to give God more than five minutes. Amen. You're going to give him more than five years. Yeah. You're going to give him more than five million years if you're not careful. Yeah. You better be careful. My text says, depart me, cursed and everlasting fire, prepare for the devil his angels, and I say without fear of contradiction, that's the most horrible, terrible thing ever said in this earth, and it's said by somebody that loved enough to die for you. Now, are you saved? Okay, if you're saved, when were you saved? Where were you saved? Can you put your finger on a time and place in your life when you came to Jesus Christ as a sinner and confessed him and said, folks, I'm one of his. He's mine. Has that ever happened to you? Well, if it hadn't happened now, it's accepted time now the day of salvation. Let's stand. Let's stand. Let's sing just so I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That thou bids me come to the old land of God. Come to the aisles are clear here. These children out of the way. There's a prayer over here at the front. The minister's here to be with you, kneel with you, lead you to Christ. And for heaven's sake, be careful about this one. <laughs> I mean, if you ain't careful about nothing, be careful about this one. This is, this is the bottom line. This is the last thing. This is the one thing you want to be sure about. All right, let's sing just time. You don't need your song books. Just time. Come ahead, brother. Come ahead. Let's sing it. Just as I you explain to me why people worry about everything in the world except the thing you ought to worry about. What you ought to worry about? Come ahead. Come on ahead. Don't, don't wait for me to stop talking or nothing, man. You get to cry as quick as you can get. And the thing is, they're careful about all this stuff. I've seen fellows take an insurance policy or a medical policy and read that thing over and read it over and check it 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 and then take a thing like this here and just say, well, there's a time and place for that when I get it so I can live it, you know. Just I'm waiting not. Just as I Who else? Come ahead. Come on. Come ahead. There's somebody waiting here to have prayer with you. Come on. One more blood. Those blood can cleanse each man. Now you see what you do when the time comes? When the time comes, you're not diligent. Diligent to make your calling and election sure. 
And that's what he told you to do. You can't be careless about this. You say, well, what good would it do? And that ain't, that ain't the problem. Well, I believe I can live it. That ain't the problem. The problem is looking somebody in the face someday that loved you enough to die for you and realizing they would have taken you tonight and you wouldn't, you wouldn't give it the proper amount of thought. You wouldn't take him seriously. Listen just as I am not with receive. Just as I am I'm sure I'm glad I'm saving it. Amen. I'm sure that if I kick the bucket tonight, you put your my coffin tomorrow morning or tomorrow night, your old dead boy there is absent the body and present with the Lord. Amen. So how do you know you're that good? I don't know I'm that good. I know I'm that bad. Yeah. You don't worry about me where I'm going to be. I'm going to be up there because of him. Yeah. Because of him. Yeah. Because of him. Yeah. Not because of me. Yeah. My preacher was dying one time, and his grandson was holding his hand and sweating blood and saying, Granddaddy, I, I just know you're going to make it to heaven. I just know you're going to make it to heaven. A man to live a good life is you here just bound to make it to heaven. That old man opened his eyes and rallied just long enough to say, don't ever talk to a dying man about living. And he said, if you're going to talk to a dying man, talk to a dying man about the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't give me that stuff about living. Tell me about some of you love enough to die for me. Yeah. Point his finger at me one day and say, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you from the foundation of the world. 